It's my great pleasure today to be back with uh, Bob Kerr. Hiya, Bob. How's things? Yeah, I'm very good. And yourself, Mary? I'm fine. Thank you very much. And the reason we're here to, uh, today, Bob, this is the ninth in a series of interviews that we've been conducting over the last year or so. And if you can lay, lay a little bit of brief background to what the previous eight interviews were about. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to climb the seven summits uh, over the, the last uh, sort of eight years or so. And uh, we've been filming a series of interviews. The first one was an introductory uh, video, just telling you a little bit about myself. And then we've uh, done interviews on each of the seven summits that I've uh, climbed to date. So Kilimanjaro in Africa, Aconcagio in South America, Elbrus in Europe, uh, Karshan's Pyramid in Papua, uh, and Denali in North America, Mount Vincent in Antarctica, and then we did a pre-Everest interview. Uh, I'm just recently back from uh, Everest. Well, as I said, Bob, it really is good to see you, but uh, as you mentioned, we're here to talk about Everest, and how did it go? Well, it was uh, a very interesting experience. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't summit, but I've uh, gained a lot of experience on the mountain. It's been a good recce for next time, when hopefully I'll be successful, Merlin. Well, one of the things you have come back with is a beard. Yeah, I've come back with a beard. I'm fresh off the mountain. <laughs> I haven't been home yet. Uh, more importantly, I've still got all my fingers and toes. <laughs> well, you've only been back in Britain, was it about five days? I've been back about five days and just gradually winding my way up the country, visiting people and uh, doing things and catching up and stuff. So, now if we concentrate on Everest for a moment, Bob, um, should we start when you sort of landed in Kathmandu and what you did before you got to base camp? Yeah, uh, I flew out to Kathmandu at the end of March uh, 2013 and uh, initially our plan was to go uh, pretty much straight round to the north side of Everest uh, to Everest Base Camp but unfortunately the Chinese border was closed uh, so we had to do our mountain acclimatisation on the south side of Everest which involved uh, flying into Lukla Airport which is one of the uh, it's in the top 10 most dangerous airports of the world. Uh, those that know me know I hate flying, so uh, it was a privilege, uh, is it, uh, to go and visit uh, Lukla. And uh, we had about a week's acclimatisation on the south side of Everest. And in that period, we uh, managed to see Everest uh, from the south side. But we also uh, walked up to Amadablam Base Camp, uh, and uh, this gave us good acclimatisation. Amadablam Base Camp is about 4,800 metres altitude, so comparable to the top of Mont Blanc in France, uh, and we were just doing that as initial climatisation before we uh, nipped round into uh, Tibet. Uh, when we got back to Kathmandu, uh, the Chinese border was open by about the 9th or 10th of April and we were able to do the overland journey uh, to get us into Tibet. And that journey took a few days because we had to do further acclimatisation uh, to get us to base camp. Uh, base camp on the north side of Everest is about 5,200 metres altitude, so higher than Mont Blanc, higher than Mount Vincent in Antarctica, higher than Carson's Pyramid. You know, it is high up there, and that was going to be our minimal living height uh, for the next six or seven weeks. And of course, the um, presumably it was a truck that you were travelling in. Uh, Go we we, we travelled uh, by bus in Nepal to the, the border in China and then we transferred over to land cruisers uh, when we got to China and uh, all of our equipment travelled in trucks to base camp. And that's driving all the way to base camp, isn't driving it? Driving all the way to base camp, uh, yeah. Through some very interesting towns in Tibet? Uh, yeah, there was some interesting towns and there was uh, quite a lot of non-mountaineering hazards in these towns, <laughs> uh, such as street dogs, uh, which uh, uh, bit uh, somebody in another expedition and one member of our expedition got mauled by a dog, uh, but thankfully didn't break the skin. Uh, part of the joy, um, Bob, of conducting these interviews with you is to briefly talk about the sort of culture involved with each place that you go to and how did you find the culture of Tibet compared to that of Nepal where you where you flew into? Uh, it was a, a bit different. Uh, the uh, Over in Tibet it 
sort of felt a little bit more backwards than uh, Nepal at times, but uh, that was just because of the infrastructure that we were encountering. We certainly uh, saw a lot more uh, in the way of the uh, Buddhist uh, chantings and uh, the temples, such as we visited the Rombok Monastery uh, below Everest Base Camp. and. Uh, but in both countries, the people were all really nice and friendly and helpful and uh, we enjoyed interacting as best we could with them. But my Nepalese and Tibetan language is not very good. <laughs> I can speak one word of both. <laughs> so life at base camp, what, uh, what's that like? Oh, life at base camp is all about uh, planning and preparation, thinking about uh, going up uh, the mountain in your different cycles and trying to rest and relax between the cycles. The cycles are when you're going up the mountain for acclimatisation, moving equipment up. Uh, so we did three cycles. Uh, when you're at base camp, uh, you're just trying to recover as much as possible uh, and get strong, ready to go up the mountain again. When you first arrive there, because it's such a high altitude, 5,200 metres, uh, your body's trying to adjust. And when I first arrived there, my rest and pulse rate was probably about 120, 130 beats per minute. So you're lying down in a tent and your heart's going boom, 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 boom. Uh, and you're burning off calories really quickly. Uh, so you're constantly trying to get food in you. You're stuffing your face with uh, unhealthy chocolate bars, Pringles, uh, and also uh, the healthier foods which are being cooked for you. Uh, and at base camp, uh, we each had our own tent because it was really important to have your own personal space when you're there uh, and uh, you could do your daily chores like your washing if you uh, needed to do some and uh, for the first time uh, ever the Adventure Peaks uh, team had a warm shower at base camp. It was a bit of uh, hard work to actually have a shower but it was really nice when you did have one. Uh, to get the water for the shower, the boys had to uh, roll a 200 litre barrel over to a nearby stream and then roll it back. So half a kilometre rolling 200 litres of water and that was all attached up to uh, basically uh, uh, a Heath Robinson electric shower. Uh, and it was just bliss having a hot shower at base camp. Uh, a lot of the life there was just resting, recuperating, eating uh, and we had uh, a number of days to spend there at various times and so we passed the time uh, sort of reading books, watching DVDs, uh, playing games such as Trivial Pursuit on an iPad and, uh, and just generally chatting and getting to know our teammates. Now, the company that you went out with... Uh, I went out with Adventure Peaks from the Lake District, uh, a company that I've used previously for expeditions, and I was very happy with uh, the service I was getting and the support from them. So how many guides represented Adventure Peaks? Uh, there was two guides went out with us, but uh, with climbing Everest, it's not a guided trip, it's uh, guide-assisted. Uh, so uh, they would give the occasional bit of advice or support and check your skill sets before doing certain dangerous things like uh, nipping up to the North Call on fixed ropes and things like that. What about Sherpa support, Bob? How, how many of uh, how many Sherpas did you have? Uh, we had six Sherpas uh, with us out on the mountain uh, and also a number of uh, support staff such as a uh, cook and base camp manager. There was a cook at advanced base camp and there was another one down at base camp. Uh, so there was quite a bit of support on the mountain. But the real heroes of Everest are the Sherpas uh, because they were helping position everything for us to then make a summit bid. They were uh, pre-pitching the tents at the North Call and higher camps for us, carrying oxygen cylinders up and they even carried freeze-dried food up to the North Call for us and all the stoves. So uh, they were trying to make life as easy as possible for us. But then again, you do pay for that service. You can go on cheaper expeditions and carry everything yourself with no support but uh, Everest is so hard to climb that you need to, uh, if you want to ma maximise your chance of success, it's worth paying a little bit more for more support. And how many more um, clients were there, Bob, in including you in all? Uh, in total, the Venture Peaks team had uh, nine clients uh, on the expedition. 
and two guides and six Sherpas. And of course this is from the north side. How many other um, parties were there? How many other teams? Uh, there was around about another 10 or 12 teams on the mountain on the north side. The north side's a lot quieter than the south side. Uh, that's partly because of the difficulties of getting into Tibet, but also it's technically harder to climb the mountain uh, up uh, from the north call side. Uh, whereas in the masses that uh, you may see pictures of queues going up Everest, that's all on the south side. Yeah. What about, um, uh, you briefly mentioned things about um, so the cost and how much it, it costs. In relation to the comparison between what it costs to go up from the south side, what's, what's the sort of difference? Uh, it's almost sort of half the price to attempt Everest on the north side compared to the south. So one of the reasons for going to the north side, apart from having less objective danger, is that uh, you can almost have two shots for the price of one uh, on the north side if you need it. And of course you mentioned objective um, dangers. You've got the Kumbu Icefall, haven't you, going up from, from the south? Yeah, you've got the Kumbu Icefall on the south side, uh, but uh, that's uh, offset a little bit uh, by the fact that on the south side you can uh, nip up to the summit fairly easily uh, and uh, and spend minimal time at altitude uh, on the south side, whereas on the north side, uh, all the technical rock climbing aspects are high up on the mountain, above 8,000 metres on the death zone, and you spend a long time above 8,000 metres on the north side. So after arriving at base camp, how many days was it after that that the first cycle started to kick in? Uh, it was after... Uh, yeah, a few days at base camp we did an initial acclimatisation walk up to 6,000 metres altitude. Uh, we didn't go all the way to the top of that particular mountain because it was over 7,000 metres. Uh, just initial acclimatisation to 6,000, came down, rested another couple of days and then we walked up to advanced base camp uh, via an intermediate base camp. Uh, advanced base camp was about uh, 22 kilometres away from base camp and uh, involved about uh, 1,350 metres of ascent. Uh, so it's quite a big push, uh, especially when you're already above the height of Mont Blanc. It's, you know, just those totals, Bob, it's it's something that sort of, I was going to say, take your breath away, and that, that's not meant to be a pun. <laughs> but, um, you know, was it 22 kilometres from, from advanced to, uh, from base camp to advanced base camp? But well, once you're at advanced base camp, um, on the first cycle, presumably you overnighted, would it be the next day that you push up towards the, the North Col? Uh, no, we rested for a couple of days at advanced base camp just to let our bodies recover and uh, try to acclimatise a bit further. Advanced base camp's at an altitude of 6,400 metres altitude. So that is higher than the majority of uh, the mountains in other continents. It's only uh, outside of Asia, there's only a few peaks in uh, South American Andes which are higher than our advanced base camp. <laughs> and what about um, then going up to the North Col? What was that like? Uh, it was quite hard work going up to the North Col because uh, you're already at extreme altitude and you really are noticing the altitude. Uh, initially it was just walking along a path uh, for about an hour to a bit called Crampon Point, which <laughs> is uh, at a corner where you're then going on to a glacier and you don your crampons, hence Crampon Point. Uh, and there you clip into uh, a fixed line that's running across the glacier. Uh, you clipped on that uh, just in case uh, there's any crevasses that you might fall into. Uh, so you're just using that as a hand line. Uh, it's pretty much a horizontal walk from Crampon Point to the base of uh, the wall that goes up to the North Col. And then it's about 350, 400 metres straight up uh, on uh, very steep uh, snow and ice. Uh, the steepest bit for us uh, this year was just the initial section and uh, we were one of the first teams to be making uh, progress up to North Col when we were home to front point on blue glacier ice uh, on fixed lines, uh, just gradually uh, getting up the first 50, 100 metres and then the angle eased and we wove our way around crevasses, over snow bridges, uh, around some more seracs and uh, using uh, occasionally uh, ladders to get 
over crevasses. Uh, it was my first ever experience of uh, using ladders uh, whilst wearing crampons and sometimes the ladders were horizontal, sometimes a bit more vertical. Uh, uh, so certainly a new experience for me but there's uh, not many ladders on the north side compared to the south side where people have to pass through the Cumbo Icefall. We only had one ladder section where there was two, two ladders tied together and it did flex a bit in the middle, but uh, <laughs> uh, there was a bit of a drop into the crevasse, but uh, it was fine. And, and called, oh, sorry, Bob, go on. Yeah, and, and then uh, once you're over these things, you just keep plodding up, and eventually you get to the North Call Camp at 7,060 metres high. And of course, you mentioned the Sherpa support before. Now, all those ladders, the ropes, and the camps, they would all be set up by the Sherpas, wouldn't they? Uh, there's... Uh, on both the north and south side there's uh, rope fixing teams, uh, so on the north side we'd each paid $400 uh, in advance for uh, Chinese rope fixers and they carry up uh, rope and ladders and, and basically from crampon point to the summit uh, there's a, a, a hand line that you can clip into and use uh, for your own safety, but it's a major undertaking for these guys to install. Uh, on the north side, it's seven millimetre rope that's used. Uh, on the south side, I'm here now, it's 10 or 11 mil. Uh, but it's very thin rope on the north side. And because uh, uh, it's quite thin, you're always a bit worried about folks standing on it with their crampons and uh, again, uh, blown against rock and wearing through. And there was a few sections where the core was exposed on the rope and few areas uh, the rope wasn't quite there and I think it was um, uh, on one of the first ascents of Everest going back to Mallory and Irving's time some of the early British expeditions so it wasn't there a tragedy with a number of Sherpas uh, died going up to the North Col because of an avalanche? Uh, yeah when Mallory and Irving were attempting it I, th I think it was one of Mallory's ar early expeditions I think there was an avalanche that killed seven uh, Sherpas and uh, occasionally we were getting snow uh, when we were up at advanced base camp and we were uh, waiting on the snow settling and uh, just reassessing conditions because uh, we were concerned that we didn't want to be avalanche. But the, the route that's set up by the rope fixers nowadays is trying to take the, uh, the line that's least likely to avalanche, but you've still got some seracs there and they could move at any time. Uh, you know, these things are never straightforward and there's always risks. So under the first cycle, you arrived at the North Col. Did you overnight then or straight down again? On the first cycle, nobody overnighted on the North Col. We, we went up uh, towards the North Col, came back down to Vance Base Camp and then all the way down to Base Camp the following day. So it was just an initial uh, get yourself up as high as you can, try and get to above the 7,000 metre mark or 23,000 feet roughly. Uh, as part of helping your body acclimatise so you could then uh, overnight the next time you went up. Were the conditions clear when you reached the North Col for the first time? Uh, first time I got up to the North Col, yeah, conditions were pretty clear and uh, you know, it was good views up there. Uh, I was, I was gonna, there's not much atmosphere. <laughs> I was going to say from there, looking up towards Everest, that must be just extraordinary, the view. It's an amazing view, just looking at Everest from wherever you are on the north side. You just see this peak way, way above you, and you think, how do you get there? But so, from the north call, it's, you can clearly see uh, a snow slope leading up to the next camp, and uh, some of the rocky bands, and you can clearly see the first, second and third step from the north call uh, leading towards the summit. So the first cycle over with, you're back in base camp. And then presumably a few days recuperation. Yeah. And then set out on the second cycle? Yep, set out in the second cycle, walk the 22 kilometres back uphill. Uh, the first time we walked up to advanced base camp, we stopped at intermediate base camp, uh, uh, 5,700 metres altitude to overnight. The second cycle, we walked all the way, all 22 kilometres in the winter. And we arrived uh, quite tired towards uh, advanced base camp. Did you find that the time on the second cycle, was that better than the first? 
Uh, yeah, my time was better on the second cycle and even better on the third cycle because yeah. uh, it was uh, clearly showing the body was adjusting to the high altitude. So the continuation of the second cycle back up to the North Col? Second cycle was up to the North Col, overnight at the North Col, so sleeping higher than any mountain in the world outside of Asia. <laughs> uh, and then uh, it was a case of walk as high as you can the next day uh, as for, for acclimatisation so I walked up to 7,200 metres altitude without oxygen uh, and then descended back down to advanced base camp the only reason why I turned around at 7,200 was I turned around, looked behind me, and nobody else from the party was with me. <laughs> uh, they'd all turned around because they thought it was too cold, whereas I'd just put on really warm duvet jacket, really warm gloves, and just kept plodding. So doing that without bottled oxygen, Bob, how many steps would you be taking before you had to sort of stop and rest and recover? As many as possible. <laughs> uh, certainly walking a lot slower than normal and... For myself, I was uh, just trying to count steps and uh, try and get in a good rhythm. So on that particular occasion, I was maybe w walking 30 steps uh, and then stopping <laughs> uh, and then uh, continue on. Uh, but it's really hard in such a rarefied atmosphere. Yeah. So it would we turn around, back to the North Col, back to advanced base? Yeah, and then walk back out to base camp again to and recover. Of and of course, going down the North Col, that's abseiling? Uh, uh, yeah, I was abseiling down uh, from the North Col. It was about 350, 400 metres straight down, uh, and it's a very direct route. There was basically one set of ropes going up the way, which I took a, a bit more of a windy route that was you could walk a little bit more easily. But the way down was just straight down uh, seven millimetre ropes and passing knots and anchor points. Uh, so it took the uh, best part of 45 minutes an hour to abseil uh, down to the base uh, of the North Col wall. Uh, some of the Sherpas uh, didn't uh, uh, use their figure of eight and abseil, they just did an arm wrap and just uh, ran down. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> so you're back at advanced base, looking forward to the third cycle which would be the summit push yeah now how many days into the expedition is this that you're ready for that third cycle to begin uh well at that stage we were waiting on uh, a suitable weather window uh so we were around about a month and a half into the expedition uh before we're starting the third cycle so um any health problems at this stage bob at all or not uh, during the expedition I'd uh, had uh, some sort of mucusy cough, cold thing uh, and sort of general high altitude hack which quite a lot of people get just from the very dry atmosphere uh, and uh, like a number of folk going to developing countries I had my, my fair share of bouts of diarrhoea and things like that uh, but at this stage uh, in terms of uh, mountain fitness, I was going strong, uh, doing very well on the mountain and uh, looking forward to the summit push. So with the third cycle, when that began, is that dictated to by the weather forecast that um, people at uh, base camp were receiving? Yeah, it's very much dictated by the, the forecast being received uh, from Adventure Peaks uh, weather provider, but also the guides go and speak to other expeditions find out what weather forecast they've got, compare weather forecasts and also try and find out when other teams are going up the mountain. You don't want everybody in the north side being on the second step all at the same time. If there's a reasonable weather window, uh, it's always good if teams space themselves out and that improves the safety for everybody else because there's less people in the way, therefore less queues and less chance of folk running out of oxygen. So the beginning of the third cycle, would this be around, would it be May it was, uh, the 20th? It was, the start of the second cycle was about 15th, 16th of May uh, when we headed out from base camp back up to advanced base camp and then uh, a couple of days rest there before then going up to the North Col to sleep uh, and then another day to go up to Camp 2, which is about 7,850 metres altitude, or 26,000 feet. Uh, and then from there, uh, from Camp 2, it's 
uh, an, another sort of five, six hours of effort to get up to the world's highest campsite at 8,300 metres altitude, so well in the death zone. And from there, you launch your summit bid. Now, of course, your journey from base camp to advanced base camp up to the North Col, yeah. and then heading up to the 7,800 metre camp. Mm -hmm. What was the journey up to that camp from the North Col like? Uh, it, was, uh, it was a straightforward journey uh, in terms of there's, there's a snow slope that goes up and there's a fixed line, so you clipped in and it's just head down, one foot in front of the other, plod, plod, plod. Uh, am I ever going to get there? <laughs> uh, it takes quite a few hours, but for that journey uh, I was using supplementary oxygen. Uh, uh, from about 7,100 metres or so uh, and the oxygen was set to 2 litres per minute flow rate uh, and I was also doing a load carry uh, to go up there so not only was it just physically walking up there but it was carrying sleeping bag and food and uh, it was hard physical work uh, so it was quite a long day plodding up a snow slope and when you just start to see the first one or two tents of camp at 7,800 metres. Uh, they're, they're, the tents are pitched on uh, a rocky ridge. And you see the first one or two tents and you think, yes, I'm at camp. But our camp, where our tents were, was a good 100 metres or so further on <laughs> uh, vertically. Uh, so it was another hour or more till we actually got the tent to the tents, having arrived at the campsite. So that journey up there, Bob, what about sort of rehydration and, and access to water and things? Uh, there's no running water f uh, from streams up there, so you have to uh, boil everything uh, or, or melt snow and ice. Uh, to, to make drinking water. So we'd made uh, some drinking water at uh, the North Call camp before heading up there, uh, filled our water bottles and uh, if you add some rehydration sachets or tablets you can uh, uh, lower the freezing point of water slightly but the, all our water bottles were in insulated containers uh, and we, we tried to maximise the chance of having liquid to drink. But uh, at altitudes and low temperatures, it can freeze very easily. It's not very pleasant having a slush puppy for your drink. <laughs> uh, but for me, heading up to high camp, uh, 7800, uh, unfortunately, the lid wasn't fully done up on my water bottle and uh, I lost all my water. It soaked into a fleece, so I was carrying really heavy uh, frozen fleece and didn't drink anything throughout the day uh, which was not good for me. <laughs> so because of that did you find any sort of effect as you were nearing that top camp? Uh, I was finding my uh, dry cough was getting much worse uh, but overall uh, I, I don't think there was any major issues with not drinking uh, but I did have uh, some effects as I was getting higher up the mountain. The last half hour or so, uh, getting towards uh, Camp 2, uh, uh, I was noticing, or I was thinking I was noticing, my sunglasses steaming over and affecting my vision. But it's just like, it's just my sunglasses, just keep going uh, up. Just, you know, you, you're getting quite frustrated that it's taken so long to get to your tent once you've arrived at the campsite. But when I got to the uh, to my tent, took off my sunglasses, I noticed that the vision in my right eye uh, was not very good. Uh, I could see fine with my left eye, but my right eye, it was like looking through greaseproof paper. It was just fogged over and uh, I could see some shapes uh, through it, but uh, there was no definition, no sharpness, and I had no depth perception with it. And uh, that wasn't good. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, I, I mentioned this to uh, one of the guides uh, and b before I, I, I mentioned it to him I knew that uh, I would have to descend because you know it's a, a medical issue which I need to uh, get to the bottom of so when I told him he said you'll need to go down I just responded I know because uh, uh, so I'm really keen to find out what's actually happened uh, I've been doing a bit of research and there's a few different uh, things that could have happened. Uh, what looks to be the most likely, but I'll need to see a specialist now and back in the UK, is that uh, because of the low oxygen levels, uh, I was getting perhaps a little bit hypoxic. 
and uh, there is a condition in mountaineers which has been seen quite often where you can get a fogging over of the lens because of hypoxia uh, and it's fairly common in mountaineers as, uh, as I've spoken to people it's uh, a, quite a lot of people have said I know somebody who's had similar condition such as Di Gilbert uh, when the uh, Scottish uh, female guide who summited Everest she was having similar issues on the summit of Everest. Uh, the first Norwegian woman to summit Everest uh, had vision problems similar to mine uh, and there's various other examples. Uh, I'm told it's maybe at least 5% of high altitude mountaineers have vision problems and when you look at altitude medicine books it says if you've got any loss of vision whatsoever it's a case for immediate descent because it could be an indication of high altitude cerebral edema uh, or uh, other serious conditions. Uh, so for myself there was no question I was going to have to descend uh, but I, I won't let that hold me back. I've still got my eyes set on the summit. I just need to find a way around a medical issue. <laughs> well, I quite admire you, Bob, because uh, ambition didn't become uh, didn't go before your health um, because you could have kept that to yourself and then... Um, risk getting pushed on the following day couldn't you? Yeah I could have quite easily and uh, well, I found out later that up at the 8,300 metre camp there was uh, an individual in another expedition who'd gone completely blind but it had similar starting symptoms and he had to be helped down by a Sherpa uh, before he started regaining some vision. What did it feel like Bob when you had to leave that 7,800 metre camp and you knew then that any prospect of you know, succeeding reaching the summit, it was succeeding reaching base camp and coming home safely but that summit bit was over for you what did it actually feel like? Uh, it's, it's quite a blow when you're uh, within 24 hours of the summit, uh, after all it's been a life goal since I've been age 12 and it, uh, Everest also uh, the seventh summit uh, for me to complete the seven summits so uh, it was really hard to turn around but uh, in my mind I knew that uh, uh, it was the right thing to do because I don't know exactly what's caused it therefore uh, things could get a lot worse and I don't want to be putting myself at risk higher up and then potentially putting other people at risk uh, say I'd I went completely blind above 8,000 metres in the death zone, I could be putting Sherpas or other people at risk of losing their lives because of my selfishness to uh, really want the summit. So I really need to understand what's happened. Uh, but uh, I'm, I am seeing that if it is due to hypoxia that caused my blindness uh, in my right eye, then, uh, then a simple solution is to use more oxygen. Uh, I'm ruling out completely trying to do Everest without oxygen, <laughs> but uh, I'm not ruling out trying to do it with a lot more. I was only on two litres per minute oxygen for that ascent. I was carrying a big load, so perhaps I could use a personal Sherpa to carry some of the load, so there's less oxygen demand on my body. And also I could crank up oxygen to four litres per minute or six litres per minute. Uh, one of the things I, I did notice at high camp, uh, when I got there and I was resting, I went on to four litres per minute oxygen and by the morning I'd regained a fair amount of my vision and uh, the oxygen cylinder was on four litres per minute so I was actually only breathing the oxygen from the cylinder for half the night. Half the night I was sleeping at 7,800 metres uh, with no oxygen uh, in addition to what was in the atmosphere and you know I'd made a good recovery at that height so to me it's very much suggesting hypoxia but I'll ask the experts. <laughs> and of course, when you did get back to base camp, you manned the comms, didn't you, for the day, I believe? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, when I descended, uh, I went to advanced base camp uh, where we had uh, a began set up. So we had email uh, correspondence with uh, Adventure Peaks head office and uh, I was also uh, manning a radio. So during the summit push of the Venture Peaks team, uh, I was in radio communications with the summit uh, team and also email in the UK and uh, this allowed Adventure Peaks to update their uh, website throughout the night uh, in the UK and uh, keep families and friends of all those making the summit push informed about their progress. 
Uh, so it was, although it was a bit disappointing for me, I was really pleased for the team that uh, as a team we got uh, six clients and two guides to the summit of Everest, which was a lot more successful than uh, numerous other teams on the mountain. Such a large Chinese team didn't get one person to the summit. Uh, so it was a very successful expedition. I was pleased to be able to support friends and family at home uh, in that way, even though I was personally disappointed. So future plans, Bob? Future plans? Well, I'll need to see an eye specialist, uh, but uh, I'm still very much thinking about uh, attempting Everest again. Uh, I've, I've got a life goal to complete after all. Uh, just I'll have a different uh, strategy for the ascent. Uh, probably use a lot more oxygen than previously and I'm also going to reassess whether I go up the north side or the south side uh, although the south side's got more objective danger uh, lower down you spend a lot less time at extreme altitude uh, and it's also uh, easier to descend than the north side so uh, I'm aware of folk who've descended the south side with uh, lost vision uh, uh, so if it happened to me again, then uh, maybe the south is better, but I need to weigh it all up. But in terms of plans, yeah, uh, two, three years' time maybe. It all depends on finance and uh, other parameters. Well, before we close off, Bob, any final thoughts on your trip to Everest? Uh, I think it was a really good uh, recce for me. Uh, it's, it's been a really good learning experience. I've never used oxygen before. But, uh, one of the things that really stuck in my mind was when I was manning the radios, uh, I, could, uh, I could hear people struggling above 8,000 metres. And there was one individual who, uh, in our expedition who uh, lost a lot of their vision high up on the mountain. And as they were descending, I was hearing their radio comms and I uh, was quite concerned for them because uh, they were sounding genuinely really scared. They weren't getting much support up there and they weren't sure if they were clipping onto the right rope. You've got old ropes up there from previous years and you've got the new one. And she, uh, this individual didn't know uh, if they were on the right rope and it sounded really scared. And at times I thought, we might lose this individual. So from a mountain rescue perspective, it was really hard to just sit back and listen uh, to some of this, these comms. Uh, but I'm glad everybody in our team made it back down safely uh, with no frostbite uh, and everybody's returned safely. So overall, for all of us, it was a successful expedition. We've all made it home and that's the key thing. Well, welcome back to Britain, Bob. And um, as ever, it's been a fascinating uh, insight to your adventures and also a fascinating insight into an attempt on the summit of Everest. So, uh, Bob Kerr for now, many, many thanks. Yeah, thank you.